Good evening, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all for attending the fourth installment of the Silfen Leadership Series. For those of you joining us for the first time this evening, uh, a little bit, a little bit of background. The speaker series was endowed by David and Lynn Silfen a few years ago to give students the opportunity to engage with and learn from dynamic leaders across myriad industries. Tonight, alongside the Bernstein Center Leadership and Student Leadership and Ethics Board, we are very happy to host Wendy Kopp from Teach for All. To introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to welcome to the stage Professor Zirek from the Finance and Economics Department, but more importantly, he also serves on the New York City Advisory Board for Teach for America. I've seen a series of uh, introductions for Wendy, and one is more impressive than the other, so I'll do the best I can. Uh, I'm actually very honored to be here and, and also very honored to serve on the advisory board at Teach for America. Um, Wendy is a guiding light for, uh, for all that goes on um, at Teach for America and Teach for All. Um, having founded the organization uh, following her senior thesis at uh, Princeton University, I believe in 1989. Uh, now Teach for America has more than 10,000 core members and alumni. Um, probably the most, the largest percentage of them in any one place or in New York, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and Wendy founded that and, and ran Teach for America from close to two decades. Um, and not that that wasn't challenging enough, she decided that maybe uh, she should expand the initiative beyond just the U.S. Uh, and started with a, another colleague, uh, Teach for All, um, which uh, operates, I guess, has. 20, 38 independent organizations working together. So uh, you're clearly not here to see me. So let me introduce uh, Wendy Kopp. Thank you for that. Um, well, I'm excited to have the chance to, to share with you all. Um, I think I was asked to share how I started all of this. Um, but I'm excited to share kind of how and why I got it started, and most importantly, why my colleagues and I are staying with it, and why we're feeling greater urgency and, and optimism than, than ever before. Um, before I dive in, though, let me get a sense of, of, of you all and how, what you're coming in here with. Um, first of all, are there any Teach for America people in the room? Any? Ooh, lots of people. OK. Interesting. Good. Um, and for all of you, if I ask the question sort of on a scale of 1 to 10, um, you know, how big is your sense of possibility that within our lifetime, kids, low-income kids, most of whom in our country, many of whom are kids of color who are facing massive challenges, all the challenges of poverty, the racism and discrimination that still exists today and such, could actually attain the kind of education that would put them on a path to fulfilling their true potential. So with one being, I have no sense of possibility at all, and 10 being, I really have a sense of possibility, like fully, we can pull this off in our lifetime. We may not be on a track to pulling it off, but we could pull it off in our lifetime. So where are you all, each of you? Let me just get a sense of the room. Okay, so we've got a range. Everyone's really hesitant. This must be like the business school thing, like we don't engage. <laughs> I thought these were like really engaged sessions. Um, yeah, it's tough. Like, but you know, and it's hard to like commit yourself to a number. But there were lots of people sort of, there were some threes and fours and there were some sixes and sevens and, and some, you know, 110. Um, so that's just helpful to understand for me where, where you're coming into this with. Um, so I, I started Teach for America really just because I was a senior in college at, at Princeton and I was part of what was called the me generation and supposedly we all just wanted to go work for investment banks and management consulting firms and I felt like I was actually part of a generation that was just searching for something that we weren't finding in terms of a way to make a real difference in the world. 
um, and yet all of the recruiters were investment banks and management consulting firms banging down our doors asking us to commit just two years to work in their firms. Um, and one day, really sparked by the fact that I had become really kind of, as a college student and concerned citizen becomes, and policy major, um, becomes obsessed with the fact that our country, which aspires to be a place of equal opportunity, really isn't one. And in fact, where you're born predicts your educational outcomes and in turn life outcomes. And I had organized a conference on this and all of this. But anyway, one day all this came together and I thought, you know what? Why aren't we being recruited as aggressively to commit two years to teach in our urban and rural communities as we were being recruited to commit two years to work on Wall Street? And it was just one of those ideas that I, I, was, I just became very obsessed with this idea, with how much difference people could make by channeling those two years into classrooms in our most under-resourced communities, but also by the thought that, like, imagine taking our country's, quote, future leaders, I mean, that's what they were calling all these graduates of colleges, and, and having their first two years be teaching in urban and rural public schools instead of working on Wall Street. Like, I thought that would change a lot like change the priorities of a generation, change the consciousness of our country, change the career direction of all these folks. Because everyone I knew was going to work in these banks and then and they were saying they would just do that for two years and then they'd go do whatever else. But then they went to business school and back into the banks. Like I knew lots of upperclassmen and I already saw it happening. So I thought how, how different would people's plans become if their first two years could be teaching in low income communities. Anyway, that was the idea. And it was very quickly far, far beyond me. Um, and maybe some of you have heard the story of the first year of Teach for America, but it was just one of these things. Like I would share this idea and people would think, doesn't that already exist? Like it, the timing was so perfect. And I, I could elaborate on that first year story, but I think it's not the most interesting piece of, of the journey. A year after I graduated, I was looking out at 500 people who became the first core of, of Teach for America. Um, and once they started teaching, that's probably when the real story <laughs> began. Um, and, and what has ensued here, I mean, over the last 25 years after going, I mean, still Teach for America continues to go through massive learning curves. You know, how do we actually do this well? How do we recruit and select not just anyone, but people who really are ready not just to survive for two years, but to make a real difference for their kids. How do we train and support them so that they can make that difference and so that they leave having learned the lessons that come from success rather than more disillusion than, than they began? You know, how do we support the alumni who do have that rare experience to then go on and maximize every year thereafter, whether they stay in education or not. So just huge programmatic learning curves and lots of other learning curves as well about how to manage a growing enterprise with quality, how to sustain all of this beyond the initial startup grants. Um, but 25 years in, now each year, um, between 40 and 50 and sometimes 60,000 people apply to Teach for America each year. Um, we have about 9,000 teachers in the midst of their two-year commitments teaching in um, 50 urban and rural communities across the country. Um, there's lots of evidence that speaks to the fact that they do have a positive impact during their two years. And about two-thirds of them never leave education. Another 20% um, are working in or around schools or low-income communities. So maybe they've gone into policy or law or medicine, but they're working on you know, policy that relates to education or legal services or public health. So you know, 86% or so of our alums are, are fully engaged full-time still in the work. Um, and there are about 50,000 of those alumni out there. So um, that's kind of... I guess where Teach for America is in this work, and I want to share a bit more in a bit about kind of what we've learned through all of those experiences, what we learn both from our core members and from our alumni and from many colleagues in, in the communities where we're working. Um, about 10 years ago, you know, I hadn't thought at all about the rest of the world. I did not wake up and decide 
let's go global. Um, but rather, there was just something in the water about 10 years ago. And within one year, I was talking to people from 13 different countries who were just determined to launch something like this in their countries. They wanted to launch Teach for India to recruit India's most promising future leaders and get them to commit two years to teach in, in high need communities and to cultivate their ongoing leadership as a force for change. And that's what led to the launch of Teach for All, which is a network of independent organizations. I mean, all locally led, governed, funded, um, really adapted to the context um, you know, of, of those countries. So in 38 countries and growing, I mean, another 30 in the pipeline, uh, organizations in this network that Teach for All itself as a global organization works to support the development of, mostly to foster learning and sharing across these organizations and ultimately, importantly, um, which we'll get to as well, but among, you know, across the alumni forces because, um, you know, if we can get to the point where in many, many countries around the world, we're channeling many more um, of the most well-educated, most capable, committed folks towards this set of issues um, and can, can help them learn from each other across borders, we think we have huge potential to, to increase the pace of change. So that's kind of at a very high level, um, kind of very high level, how things have progressed over the last 25 years. But I want to share with you all the most salient lessons of this work to this point, which, and, and I'm going to share three, three big lessons, um, which are really what, what fuel my, my sense of urgency in all of this at this point. Um, the first of them is, is actually just the evidence that we've seen that we actually can solve this problem. And I think it's really hard. I mean, for you all as students in the US who maybe have time to read or at least see on social media like the coverage of you know, education in our country today, I just think you probably have no idea, I mean, how much things have changed in 25 years. When I graduated from college, um, you know, one of the hit movies was Stand and Deliver. Have you all seen Stand and Deliver? Um, it made a hero of a teacher in East Los Angeles named Jaime Escalante. Um, he had coached his kids, his class, to pass the AP calculus exam, and no one believed it. The ET ETS, the testing company, didn't believe it. They made the t kids retake the test. Hollywood thought this guy's going to be a hero. Let's make a movie of him. And I think it's, it's so fascinating to remember that that is where we were. I watched that movie, and I myself, which is I'm truly ashamed of, didn't go say, let's go find out how we did it so that we can replicate the success. We truly just thought he was, had magical powers. Like it was his charisma, but that that was something that we couldn't replicate. And now, you know, we have not only lots of classrooms um, showing that that's possible, but we have hundreds of whole schools in this country taking kids who on average have an 8% likelihood of, of getting through college and putting them on a path to more like 50% of them, higher than the national average. Um, we didn't even know that that was possible 25 years ago. And now the question isn't, is it possible? You know, for a while it was, can we do it at a whole school level? And now it's, can we do it at a whole community level? And even to that question, we're seeing you know, real progress, which again, you would never know from reading the New York Times or any of the other media outlets, but think about this city. If you were walking around this city, you know, even you know, 15 years ago, let alone 25 years ago, and walking around this city schools today, meaning, you just can't believe the difference. I mean, when we started placing teachers in New York City, I would walk into massive schools, right? Like 3,000 kid, you know, high schools, 1,200 kid middle schools where you would walk in and there would be just perennially a feeling of chaos, a feeling of lack of safety. We had 3,000 kid high schools with 30% graduation rates in this city 15 years ago. You know, I think about a particular middle school. Our office had told me, go to this middle school. This is the best middle school. And they said that because this principal had actually figured out how to 
how to create a positive culture, which is a big feat in a 1,200 kid middle school. He was standing at the door, the kind of guy who knew every kid's name, and he had created a positive culture. And when I asked for the results, I realized that school did no better than any other school. They were all pretty much performing the same, which was dismally. If you sent me to a school like that today as one of the best, people would be like, I mean, no one would ever do that because we have exceptional schools in this city, lots of them. And we don't have any, we don't have any 1,200 kid middle schools left and we don't have any 3,000 kid high schools. We have high schools with four or 500 kids and an average, you know, 60 to 70% graduation rate. Still not good enough, but in this city, under the tenure just of Joel Klein, the embattled you know, chancellor who people choose to not love, the graduation rate for African American and Latino kids went up 20 points in his 10 years alone. We have 10,000 more kids, we have 15,000 more kids graduating a year from New York City, 15,000 more kids a year than did 10 years ago. And we have 10,000 more kids enrolling in the city university system. Fourth graders are a full year ahead of where they were in their performance levels based on the NAEP versus, you know, I guess now 12 years ago. Um, so things have changed, and I'm telling you about New York because we are here in New York, but I could tell you about so many communities where actually the results have been much more dramatic. And even on an aggregate scale, I mean, would you ever guess that our country is making progress? I mean, you would never guess it. But if you look at the NAEP, which is the most highly regarded assessment that we have, um, you see that in the 30 years, like up until 15 years ago, it took 30 years for the average reading scores of just to pick one metric, nine-year-olds, to move up four points. It took 30 years for four points of progress. That's 0.1 point a year. We made seven times the progress in the last 15 years on average. Kids made nine points of progress in the last 15 years. <coughs> African-American kids made 20 points of progress. Latino kids made 15 points of progress. So this is all just to say that, you know, I mean, if you got me on another day, I could tell you about how messed up things are for kids in our country. There's so much that's wrong. And if you just want evidence of it, we can go a few blocks away and visit schools and walk around and talk with kids and talk with families and realize, oh my gosh, our country is not living up to its promise. But the reality is that we know so much more now than we knew 25 years ago about how to actually provide kids with the kind of supports and the educational opportunities they need to actually have a chance to get essentially out of the cycle of poverty. Um, and we've actually seen that we can, we can make real progress not only at the level of classrooms, but at the level of whole schools, whole communities, and even of our whole very complicated country. So it's just to say, like, we can make progress in this. That's, that's, one, that's one, one lesson which, which keeps me going. Because if we can, then we, we have a responsibility to figure out. If we know we can't. This can be done. So how do, we, how do we actually come at it in a way that makes more significant progress? The second um, big lesson is just about it's about, about the fact that leadership is the core of the solution. Um, and that, you know, we think this approach is one of any number of you know, sort of producers of the leadership that we need to see. The reason I say that is that, you know, I think, uh, ask yourselves out there as you, as you listen to all this, like, what is your theory? Like, why do we have the outcomes that we have in our highest need communities? I'm wondering what's running through your mind. I think some people think that we think that it's because maybe we think teachers aren't effective in low-income communities. Is that what you think we think? Because that's not, that's not what we've seen. We think there are lots of good teachers. There are other teachers who aren't as good. Um, but that's not why we have this problem. We have this problem because there are whole segments of kids, and this is true the world over, it turns out, who are facing massive extra challenges that kids like my own don't face. And they show up at schools that were never set up to meet their extra needs. They were set up with even less resources than 
the schools that more privileged folks send their kids to. And we have that situation because of prevailing mindsets and policies and practices. It is a massive systemic problem. So when you realize that, that's the issue. So no one thing is going to solve it. Our policymakers don't always realize that, right? Like I could go back and name every year for the intervention that became the thing. We're now still in the fix the teacher phase. Like if we could just fix the teachers, we would solve the problem. All the research shows that. Mm, when you think about the nature of the problem, how are we going to have one million teachers in low income communities going to super heroic extents, not just for two years, but for every year of their careers to make up for all the challenges that are facing the kids and all the lack of capacity of the system in order to produce game-changing results for kids. We're not going to do it through fixing the teachers. Maybe we should give kids tablets. I mean, there are people, lots of people out there in the world right now who are literally propagating that as the answer. Really? For the kids who need the most, we're going to give them tablets? What happens when I give my own kid a tablet? I will tell you, it's not always so productive. Give every parent a voucher, make every school a charter. There's no one thing. It's going to take so much, right? We know we can make progress, but it's going to take so much. And any Teach for America person here or anyone else who has actually been in this through some other channel knows there's no one thing, right? It's going to take so much. It's going to take so much at every level of the education system. It's going to take policy change. It's going to need a lot of things outside of our schools so that we can take the pressure off of the schools and actually provide kids with more of the supports that they need before they even show up at school doors. Like, it's just going to take a lot. And so the big question that that leads really all of us across the Teach for All network to obsess about is, who is going to do all of this? Who's going to make all the changes that need to be made in a world where almost everywhere, almost in every country, it turns out, I don't think there's an exception to this. Even in the places that we think send their top people towards this stuff, no, they don't. They send their top people to finance, technology, medicine, hopefully, sometimes, law, everywhere except towards this massive set of challenges facing our most marginalized kids. Um, so that is what we think we need to change. Like We think that we need a good fair share of the folks who all those companies are out there saying, we have to get these folks because people are everything. You know, Think about all the business leaders you all have talked about, talked to, heard from. Like They all think people are everything. You know, you talk to Mark Zuckerberg, he's like, you think technology built this company? No way, it was people. Talk to Steve Jobs, he said the same thing. Like, we all know people, talent, leadership, and there's a feeding frenzy for the top talent. And then to think about how do we develop that talent, that's, that's kind of, it's, it's the same thing in, in education. Wherever you see a Jaime Escalante-like classroom, you realize, oh my gosh, there's a teacher who's one of the most inspiring leaders you've ever met. Wherever you find one of those hundreds of schools that's putting whole buildings full of kids on a different trajectory without any exception. It's run by a leader who is on a mission, who actually has the skills to build a team, build a culture, and to drive towards results in a really effective way. Wherever you see communities that have made real progress, always there is a constellation of leaders who have come together, who are working this from so many different levels who are actually rooted in understanding what's possible and in a very real understanding of, um, you know, of actually what it's going to take to ensure that kids succeed. Um, there are lots of sources of that leadership, as I said. It is kind of amazing. I mean, you look at the degree to which if you took all those Teach for America people who've been brought into this over the last 25 years out of the equation, how much of the leadership and energy you would take away. You know, I think about just New York, and this is a big city, and we started out here for years and years and years placing 100 people a year. So we're a tiny blip, um, but our people are running 150 schools. They're the assistant principals at another 170 schools. Um, they're 1,500. The alumni themselves are just 1,500 teachers in the system, including some of the, the strongest. There are 60 folks down at the Department of Ed running everything from 
you know, the whole pre-K initiative, early ed initiative to, to various other things like teacher development and such, um, you would just take away a lot of the energy and leadership in the system. And, and I look at so many of other communities, like from New Orleans to Oakland, whatever, and you see, gosh, New Orleans, I mean, that city has gone through an educational transformation, but 40% of those principals are Teach for America people, and the leaders of most of the NGOs supporting the change are Teach for America folks. They're 20% of the teachers across the whole city, just the alumni. So it's all to say, like, Leadership matters, and, and ultimately that is a huge piece of what is fueling us to say we've got to stay the course in this and bring in as many folks as possible and become as effective as we can in supporting them to actually fulfill their potential as, as effective leaders. The third big um, you know, learning for me and, and the thing that has me truly just fired up about the fact that we could actually pull this off in our lifetime is just realizing how much more quickly we can move if we take a global approach. Um, one of the things that becomes really clear whenever, I was just in New Zealand with 200 people from 42 countries where we had convened folks to share what we'd learned over the past year and to really learn from the New Zealand community which has made, you know, has, has done some incredible work with the, kind of, with the indigenous Maori population. Um, and I was just so struck by the fact, once again, I mean, the roots of this issue are actually eerily similar from place to place, to the point that initially you just realize, wow, I mean, it's very depressing to realize that all over the world we're fighting similar forces of gravity. Like, it, it can be very depressing until you realize that the silver lining is it means the solutions are shareable. Um, and so the notion of you know, already, in fact, many of the learnings that have been made here are informing these folks all over the world and they're inventing new solutions that are, are coming back to inform the progress here. So there's more to be said about that, but I, that's what gives me as much optimism as anything, is just realizing that we could ultimately produce a world where we're channeling a much greater fraction of the most well-prepared future leaders um, towards this set of issues as part of a global network where they are not only pioneering solutions in their own countries and leading the charge on the change that needs to happen, but also sharing those solutions with each other. So that instead of going through all these individual learning curves in one country or another, we're actually going through one big learning curve. Like that has huge potential to increase the pace of change. Um, so that is, that, is, that is what fuels my optimism. And, you know, I guess I asked you the question at the beginning, um, just to try to make sure I understood where you were coming into this with. I guess what I've come to believe, as I already shared, is that we actually, we can do this. We, we actually could do this in our lifetime. But there is a very big question, which is whether enough um, real leaders will step up and decide to channel their energy in, in that direction. Um, and so I hope you all, some of you have already plunged into all of this, it seems, but I hope that those of you who are less intimately connected to all of this will actually, first of all, try to get more informed. Like, go see for yourself. There are so many incredible schools in the city blocks from here showing people what is actually possible. Um, showing, I mean, they're not really sh there to show people, they're just making it happen for kids, and, and I think you could see and, and learn a lot there. And, and I just hope each of you will also think about what you can do um, to, be, to be part of the solution. So thank you for listening, and I'm excited to just engage in a discussion about whatever seems relevant to you all. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. So I guess, how do you view the best way to get more more leaders involved involved in teaching? Is it you know changing cultural norms? Is it, you know improving um, you know, compensation for teachers? Like, what, what, what do you think is the best way to attract more more talent to the field? Um, I think we need to do a whole lot of different things in order to you know elevate, elevate and strengthen the profession of teaching. Um, I guess, so I, I want to say two things. One is that I think there is a misperception out there about Teach for America, which is that, I mean, 
we don't view ourselves as creating that solution. You know, we think our alumni will go off alongside many others and pioneer those solutions just like others are pioneering solutions to the design of schools and the way school systems are managed and, and the way early ed is provided and the hopefully economic development of our low income communities since it's all so interconnected. Um, so I do just wanna be clear about that. Like when I say leadership, I think, I think we need more people who understand intimately what you understand having taught successfully in this context. I just think teaching shows you everything. You see the microcosm of the world playing out in your classroom and, and you come to understand the many, many things that need to change if we're ever gonna get where we need to go. So that, that's one thing I would say. I think our alumni have lots of different views on how do we really strengthen the profession. Um, you know, one thing that we've seen incredible progress on in the last 25 years in this country is that, I mean, 25 years ago, our school systems were not, I mean, I actually applied to it for a job in the New York City public school system, and you would send in your thing and have like a three to five minute interview with the one guy who was sitting in the central board. And, and I mean, that interview consisted with him asking me why I wanted to do this, and then laughing and saying, you're all right. That was the way to get certified to teach in New York City. Um, I spoke at conferences 20 years ago saying, you know what, you guys should do what we do. There's nothing holding you back. You could go out and recruit. You could recruit at schools of education. 40% of the people who major in education never go into teaching. And those include the most highly qualified of them because they're sought after by all these other sectors. So you all could go out, you could hire recruiters, you could send them to campuses, you could develop really rigorous selection processes, you could actually invest in the training and support of your teachers. And I remember the head of the progressive union who was a great guy raising his hand and said, why is it always this way? Why do we have to do that? They don't have to do that in other sectors. Like there was no culture, there was no understanding of how effective human capital operations work. And it's not to blame the people in the puzzle. They had been brought up in a system that hadn't ever operated that way, so how would they know? They'd been in education forever. So all to say, I mean, that has changed a lot. We now have the human resources people, I'll stop this rant in a bit, but it just shows you too how much progress we actually are making, and this is one piece of the puzzle. I mean, we need to pay teachers differently. There are school systems now paying teachers very differently. Um, we need to figure out, I mean, we don't know how to develop teachers in this country. That is, I think we're having a totally disingenuous discussion about teacher development, as if we know how to do it and we just aren't willing to, so we do crash courses like TFA, no, we don't know how to do it. We're the most studied teacher ed program in the country and we actually have the best results and they're not that great. Granted, like it's really tough. We don't know how to do it. We need to learn a lot more about that. So I think there's just a lot to be done. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just obviously on a, on a rant about the, the school system stuff. <laughs> but anyway, I'll cut it off. Yeah, um, I think the question of what to take in is less complicated than the question of how to, you know, how to navigate the public conversation. Um, you know, I think, I think that we've all learned a lot. I've certainly learned a lot in the course of this, this journey. And there's clearly a lot, there's a lot that we would do differently and approach differently if we could could start off today. And, and there's also, you know, it's easy to say that 25 years in and, and it's, it's harder when you're, you're in it. I mean, we wouldn't even know some of those lessons if it weren't for some of the progress that has been made. You know, so it's, it's, it's complicated, but there's a lot. I mean, if you Teach for America has evolved a lot, it continues to evolve. It takes in a lot. It takes in a lot and it evolves what it does a lot. Um, and I could speak more specifically to some of that, but I think there's still a question about, I mean, to me,